Um, Pop Smetsabansu, uh, former NBA player, of one of only two of Ghanaian descent to ever play in the NBA. I was born and raised in London, England, though. Um, moved to the U.S. when I was 16 um, from London, England, uh, at a time when basketball wasn't a big sport in the U.K. Moved to the U.S., uh, played basketball at George Washington for four years uh, there. Then I went on to start my professional career where I played in the NBA for five years and another five years. I played overseas in various countries such as Italy, France, Russia, Spain, Turkey, uh, and Greece. And nice. then retired in about 2016. And that's what have a number of different jobs in, in on the NBA executive side. I worked for the NBA Players Association for a year. And then that's when I discovered my love for um, being an executive. And then I, uh, I, was, uh, I scouted with the San Antonio Spurs for two years, uh, then got onto the um, team side where I was um, general manager of the Wizards G League team, started the expansion team there. And then in 2021, I moved on to the Knicks and I'm currently president of minor league operations over there. Nice. And that's what brings me here today. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being here. And thank you for having me. I'm actually curious about if you thought growing up, if you thought that basketball would take you to all these places or what, what you knew um, about it as, as a young kid. I just think about my experience growing up um, with a Ghanaian father and like the, my, what my expectations were, what the expectations for my career was. Mm -hmm. And just curious if... I definitely envisioned it. The, of that. <laughs> I definitely envisioned it. Definitely hoped for it. Um, but, you know, when you have hope, then and you have that audacity you can that's that's a start and so when i saw different opportunities in my life like the opportunity to move to the u.s at 16 that just seemed like it was a step in the right direction to what my ultimate dream was in using basketball as an influence and you know little things happen in the course of my career i go to gw i have a scholarship which i never thought i would uh, then go on to the NBA, which I, I absolutely didn't think was, uh, I, like I said, I envisioned it, where there was a possibility, you know, or in the realm of my possibility. Um, I didn't think so either. And when I was able to achieve that, I got exposed to another life and, you know, uh, my ability to influence. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that allowed me to, to pursue something like Seed Academy Ghana because I achieved everything else along the way that I had set my mind to. And now it's pushed me to continue to, you know, see how much influence I can have. Let's talk about Seed Academy. Can you talk about some of the key motivations or like any stories that you might have that really drove you to Seed Academy from the NBA or just from childhood? Well, yeah, like I said, I had a coach that influenced me at a young age um, and you know, I always knew that I wanted to have, like I said, some similar influence. And when I saw, you know, the commitment, the sacrifice that he had, I knew I had to at least match that to, to, to impact somebody the same way he impacted me. And along the way, I met certain individuals in my basketball career that um, have influenced me in that way. And one of them is Amadou Galofal, who's the mm -hmm. current president of the Basketball Africa League. Um, I met him at a young age when I was playing basketball and seeing somebody who actually looks like me in an executive position, a position of influence in the NBA. And the influence he had on me being able to pursue my NBA dream and his, his, his passion and his grace towards helping others is what led to me wanting to name my academy after his academy in, in Senegal because I saw how organic and pure he was. Mm. And I, I felt like there was a likeness there. And so I wanted to make sure that, you know, I would pay respect to him, to what he's done, and sh show the, love, the seed that he planted in me and what fruit it could bear. And that's been the influence for me, and I've seen what he's been able to do over the last 20 years and know that I can use him as a shining example, but I could also use him as... Um, a way forward you know I can I can build on the stuff that he's done well I can you know correct some of the mistakes he may have made and this is what he's told me 
And so it's allowed me to, to move in this direction and, you know, uh, allow me to hit the ground running when it comes to building an ecosystem that we're, we're trying to build in, at Seed Academy Ghana. So, you know, that was the main influence to, to how I became, uh, how Seed Academy Ghana came about. And what is Seed Academy Ghana? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Let me not skip over that. So Seed Academy Ghana is, like I said, it's my way of giving back to Ghana's youth. youth. When I played, I couldn't put my name on something. I couldn't really wrap my arms around something when I was playing in the NBA. But I knew now that I had gotten to the NBA, I could have influence and what that looked like. So and it wasn't until 2019. I remember coming here in 2013. Let me rewind for a second. And, you know, we, the NBA did its first camps in Accra, Kumasi, and Cape Coast. Mm -hmm. And I saw a number of kids that looked just like me. And I saw the, the passion and the hunger in their eyes of just wanting to live their dreams out playing a sport, playing the sport that I love and the sport that's blessed me. And, but I saw a lack of opportunity. So that was in 2013. Uh, fast forward to 2019, um, I had to turn those words into action. Mm. And that's when we, you know, uh, my brother and I and, you know, some other key individuals that, you know, have the same passion we, we started Seed Academy Ghana. And I remember texting him and my sister Benny about wanting to do a camp a week later. And I remember just letting them know what we want, what I needed and what we had to get done. And a week later, I had a, a couple of days, a couple hours later, sorry, I had a logo, I had a wow. flyer, everything. And I was like, wow, this is a real thing. That's beautiful. So we, you know, we do the camp and we think it's gonna be for about 80 to 100 kids. Over the course of two days, 400 showed up. Oh, my gosh. That's what I said. <laughs> 400 showed up, and it, it opened my eyes to the possibilities that we could have here. But it also opened my eyes to the void that needed to be filled. There was, you know, there was a love, there was a hunger, there was a passion for the sport, but there were no infrastructure or resources mm -hmm. that could truly provide something for these kids. And so I was like, I need to be the change that I want to see and use my connections and my influence to, to really have that impact. And so we started that, COVID happened, slowed everything down for everything. a couple, <laughs> for couple of years. And then, you know, 2022 came and we, we, we started back up with our first in-person camp, this time last year in December of 2022. And we saw the impact firsthand. Yeah. We saw what we could do. And so we, we saw that and then we started to think bigger. We started to, to really want to um, expand. And, you know, that was the start of Seed Academy Ghana. And, you know, we started working with various academies across the, across the country and become as inclusive as possible. Um, wanted to make sure it's free to all the players, all, to the, all, all the students, boys and girls. Um, but we want to use basketball as a tool mm -hmm. to influence uh, a next generation and a community and build that ecosystem because we understand that the, this younger generation, this generation to come is going gonna, is gonna to be the future leaders of tomorrow. They're going to be the ones that are going to be running Africa. They're going to be the ones that are going to be changing Africa. So let's teach them to be leaders. Let's teach them to, to let's put those tools in their hands to guide them along that path. And, you know, that's the driving force behind Seed Academy Ghana. And what's the age range? Uh, right now, we're, we want to start as young as eight. And, you know, I wouldn't say cap it at 18, but, you know, as far as the basketball is concerned, you know, it's 8 to 18. But, you know, again, we want to make sure that the 8-year-old that gets the exposed to the sport and the opportunities that it presents, you know, when they turn 18, we're looking at the impact that it could have had of the, on their lives. And we're already seeing it with the initiatives we had just this past week. So, you know, it's, um, it's exciting. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, you know, when you see – the fruit that comes of it, especially in the immediate, it, um, it's invigorating. I love that. I love that. So it's special to use sports as a tool and, mm -hmm. and basketball as a tool. Um, and it's a really special way to make connections with young people, especially young African athletes. Mm -hmm. And um, creating that community is really special as well. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Thank you for that. Thank you. I'm curious about uh, if there are any core values or experiences that you you want to pass down to the young African athletes that you're working with and that are a part of the Seed Academy or just in general? Sankofa. Mm. Reach back and get. 
that's our whole basis. That's what we, the reason why we do what we do. I didn't want to be the last Ghanaian in the NBA. If I have the influence, if I have the network, if I have the reach, if I can reach forward, I can definitely reach back. And so that's, that's what we want. We want others to see that and see the, the opportunities that was granted to them and make sure they can grant it to a few more other people and so on and so forth because somebody did it to me. So important. That's, and that's the core of it. That's what keeps us going. This is why we're doing it. You know, I was asked about sacrifices the other day, and, you know, you, you ask yourself, why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. And then you have to think about your core values. You have to think about your why and what, what, what pushes you and what allows you to have those sleepless nights or have those long, long days. Mm-hmm. You know, but it, when you see those kids' faces, when you see the joy in their faces, when you, when you provide something to them, or give them an opportunity to be great. You're like, okay, I get it. Yeah, this is I'll why never I do forget it. it. You'll <laughs> never forget it. So it's it's heartwarming and like I said, invigorating at the same time. So you mentioned sacrifices, and um, I'm curious about any other like challenges, um, challenges that you see specifically young African athletes um, facing, uh, and specifically how Seed Academy um, has the opportunity to step in and address some of those challenges or um, areas for growth, whatever they may be. Well, at the core of it, it's the, like I said, the infrastructure and resources. Mm. You know, basketball is an indoor sport. I can name on one hand how many indoor um, courts there are in the whole country. Wow. You know, I've never maybe seen on one. <laughs> exactly. But you see a number of them outdoor. Mm-hmm. And why that's significant is basketball is an indoor sport and you want to make, and you know, when you play outside, you have to adhere to the elements. If it rains, so be it. Yeah, this is Ghana, it's a tropical country, but at the same time, you know, we did our three on three earlier this year and it rained for five hours. Normally you could just go into a gym and play the, and play a sp- yeah. play. We couldn't do that. And, but you see those kids' faces, you're like, we have, this has to happen. Something has to change and you have to continue along this path so you can have that impact. So is the goal to build? That was the next part. Yeah. I'm well, yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. Nah, that's all right. That's all right. The goal, the goal is, you know, to build a facility, build facilities multiple across the country that can allow free and equitable access to everybody that wants to play the game and play it the right way. Are there risks associated, just out of curiosity, with playing outside and oh, in yeah. the elements, like playing? I know basketball is a contact sport. Like what? Well, let's let's just start with the heat in Ghana. You know, one of the things we have to be mindful of at that camp is you know players getting dehydrated, mm-hmm. overheating. Like when it's that hot, you know, you have to be mindful of it. And if it's raining and you know the court is not all the way dry, you know you can slip and fall, and you know it can really get exposed to some some bad injuries in those elements that you could control inside. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's, that's just one. And then obviously the weather. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's either too hot and it's always raining. You know, you don't want to get injured, but then because of the weather, you know, that's, you're exposed to that. So making sure we can provide um, a controlled environment that can allow these players to just play the game and not have to worry about it. Because what do they do when it's rain season? You don't just, you don't play basketball? Yeah. <laughs> like that, that, that can't be a thing. That's why we're working to level the playing field and give these kids an opportunity to really live their dreams and their lives, you know, through the game of basketball. Are there any stories that you want to share about the impact that you've seen, like, in action? I've always loved hearing about, you know, like, specific stories and experiences. There's, like, a specific person. And yeah, there's a, uh, there's a couple, actually. Like, I mean, just being present here. Last year we were, we were, we wanted to take a picture at a court. Mm-hmm. And I remember pulling up to the court and there was these kids playing soccer on this basketball court, which was pretty, un, <laughs> pretty um, ironic. And, you know, we asked them, could we, could we, do they mind if we, you know, if they stopped their game for a second, if we could take a picture. And I was very sensitive to the, and respectful of their, of their game mm-hmm. because, you know, I understood that part and didn't want to, to inf- in, infringe on what they were doing. So I was like, we'll be two minutes, let's, you know, let's take the photo and we'll be out of, you know, out of your way. Young kids, seven to 10 years old. 
And we take the picture, and I just remember a total silence when we're taking this picture. Mm. And we're done with it, and I'm there with my, my fiance, and she's like, give them the basketball. You know, so we give them the basketball and, you know, thank them for their time and their patience, and we're walking to the car, and we start hearing the ball bouncing. Oh. And I turn around, and these kids are playing basketball. I'm what? getting <laughs> emotional. Yeah, I mean, I get emotional <laughs> telling the story. Yeah. Like the immediate impact of putting a ball in somebody's hand. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. And it's just like when someone opens that door for you, like what, it, what are the remaining possibilities? Mm-hmm. What else can happen? Like what else? And the community, like it's a team sport. So the yeah. community that's built from that, really, really Yeah, and we, and we looked at each other and, and we're like, exactly. Like, that's the impact. This is why. This is why. Yeah. And it happened again this, when we did our camp. And our, that we had a coaches clinic as well as, um, you know, our, we had a pitch competition. Mm. We had a pitch competition where we challenged the kids. You know, we had a group. We had our camp, our Elite 50 camp this year, this, this year where we had about 15 boys and girls from every coast in Togo come in be immersed in this culture and this community and go through this camping process so that they could be exposed to a different way of life too. Um, and then we had a BAL for her clinic also for the under 23 girls. So it was under 50, under 18 boys um, camp for 50 players and then under 23 girls camp. But we also wanted to make sure we implemented some of the programming that we, we would provide when we, we develop our league structure in regards to the life skills, the community service, portion of things and so we had you know there was a classroom section for the young ladies and then for the overall uh, um, attendees we had a pitch competition and the pitch competition was about changing your community Mm. and you know the competition was identify a problem then understand the problem in your community now think of an innovative solution that you as a youth can can execute and apply. And we put them into about groups of six or seven different, obviously, boys and girls. There were different religions, obviously, different languages with the Togolese and the Ivorians, um, which was going to force communication, was going to force teamwork and collaboration. And I just remember, you know, giving them the instructions to this pitch competition and letting them know that the winner would get an opportunity to go to Afro Future. That's lit. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sure that got and them And so going. that kind of got them, uh, gave them a jolt. But seeing these kids having already a half a page of notes before I've even done, uh-huh. even done, you know, letting them know what the whole the whole competition is, they were already locked in. It's just so sp- special. Like I'm a social worker, and so. Mm-hmm community and change coming from a specific community particularly young people is Mm. so powerful like to give them the microphone or like give them the the platform to talk about what they want to see is so important Mm -hmm. and it's like that's how we that's how you make change that's how you make sustainable change because they're going to be the ones that are here when we're not Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so yeah and and so we, we, we challenged them and said no don't ask from your parents. Mm-hmm. Don't ask the government. Don't blame nobody else. Be the change you want to see. We said, how can you as the youth do it? And seeing the passion, mm-hmm. you know, seeing the emotion of it, like these, this, is, this directly affects these kids. They were talking about drug abuse. They were talking about peer and parental wow. pressure. They were talking about, you know, just, you know, having to get a job at the age of 12 and not being able to pursue basketball because it's going to take away from them having to earn money. It's things we don't even think yeah. about because we have our own set of issues. Mm-hmm. But seeing that, I was like, oh. And then them getting less activating them and letting them know that, hey, I can actually change this. Mm-hmm. And so that was a, another example of seeing some of the fruit that it bears when you, when you empower somebody. And so that's the invigor- that's what that's the invigorating feeling you get that to keep you going. So you know those two stories are just two that I often revert to when I want to dig deeper, and you know just continue down this path. 
What do you see as the future of Seed Academy? Is there anything specific that you want to share with people? Um, what the future is, I'm not going to put a cap on it, but I do want to to see that how far this impact can go. We're already seeing, you know, every as long as we go on, we get these these moments, these moments where we see an impact, where we see a change. And every time we see them, we know we're a step closer to wanting to achieve the broader goal of creating this ecosystem of leaders. When we start seeing that happen and start seeing them reach back and get, you know, again, we may not see, you know, the ultimate result. I want to see the launch pad, though. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see the launch pad. Definitely. So that's what, that's what keeps us going. So outside of basketball, is there anything from your life, upbringing, and, and career as an executive mm -hmm. that you want to share with young African athletes and that you um, hope will uplift them? I hope they reciprocate by sharing their blessings. Mm -hmm. That's all I want in return. You know, we often do things in life where we want others to be like us. If you have an opportunity to be blessed, then you have an opportunity to bless others. A good friend of mine said this quote about Africa has always been about what is needed. It's time to show what it has. And we're a product of what Africa has. So if you can, you can, you can showcase what Africa has, if you can help cultivate the soil and pour back into it, why not? That's what keeps me going. Would you encourage other Africans? I think I know the, <laughs> the answer to this. But to make the journey back home, to establish real meaningful connections, whether it's business, personal, or otherwise, and why? I would definitely encourage other diasporans to come back. Because if it had any level of impact, the sense, any semblance or any a similar level of impact that it had on me, on them, it would be life-changing. Every time I see somebody when they tell me it's their first time to Ghana, mm. I'm like, oh, just be prepared for your life to change. And they, they, they receive it, but they never really truly know until it's actually happened. Until they see a family member that looks, somebody on the street that looks like a family member. Until they really feel like they're home. You know, you won't understand the power of being here until you, you, your feet are on the soil and you have those experiences and you have those interactions. That doesn't happen until you come. So I always say be prepared to have your life changed. So I know you're based in the US mm -hmm. um, and you have you founded Seed Academy. It's given you an opportunity to mm -hmm. really be here or more of a reason to come back and forth mm -hmm. to Ghana. Um, do you see yourself completely moving here? Definitely, absolutely. You know, the, the, the ultimate goal is the more, I, the more I'm here, the more I'm present, um, the more you continue to understand your purpose, mm -hmm. understand your level of impact and what you can achieve. And it becomes more and more a reality. As a kid, I felt like I was forced to run away from it. Mm -hmm. And there was difficulties. It was difficulties to, to embrace my culture and to embrace the you know, the heritage. And it wasn't until I came of age in my 30s that I really started to seek the knowledge and seek, you know, the understanding of this, of my culture. And it, it breaks me down to think I ran from it for so long. And I feel like the understanding of culture is what, or the embrace to want to understand is what's keeping a lot of diasporans like myself away from it. It wasn't cool growing up in the 80s and 90s to be African. It wasn't cool. Mm -mm. You know, I, I changed my middle name, you know, to, to tell everybody my name was Dwayne. And, you know, if you were to hear that middle name in my culture, you would already know that it's of royalty. And to know that, you know, growing up, I felt more comfortable being called a, a more common name or a name that people would, not you know, turn their nose up to or be like, what does that mean? So that's what keep, keeps you away, I feel, because you're not comfortable, you know, in that setting. You're not comfortable in something. But now being African is cool. 
because the understanding of the of the culture and the power behind it. So when people come home, when they get here, they have to experience it. They have to be of it. They have to be immersed in it. Mm -hmm. They have to feel it because it makes going back to your respective country where you're from. It gives you a more uh, a better understanding of life, a better understanding of who you are, where you come from, why mm -hmm. you do this, why your ancestors went through what they did, where this this part of your culture comes from. It's deeply rooted in us. Where you're like I said, you're gonna see somebody that looks like a family member. You're gonna see an aunt and an uncle. That's gonna happen when you come home. So that's the part that I feel will push the diasporans to, to not only come back, once once they've come back, to 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 pour back mm. in and then cultivate the soil. So that in another four hundred years, we're talking about what happened when we it came full circle. Mm. And instead of things going the same way it did 400 years prior, it was the opulence. It was the success stories. It was the power behind the culture. So that's, that's, that's what I feel is keeping us away. That's what makes me proud to be an African. But that's also why we have to take the next step in doing so that we can receive that and pour back into the soil and continue to allow it to bear fruit rich you know, enrich the soil so it can bear the fruit. Mm -hmm. We hope that you enjoyed the conversation and that you use this as an opportunity to reflect on the ways that you can be a blessing to someone else. Uh, please like, comment, subscribe, share, and get involved. Engage in the conversation with us. If there's something that stood out to you, here's your opportunity to engage in the conversation with community. Thank you. <laughs>